Hey guys, as a free sample of what's inside my hand-drawn camera movement course, I'm going to play for you the first video in my window jump demonstration series. This is a 12 part video series in the course and I'm playing you the first video. And it's just one of 43 videos in this course, which fully unpacks this specialized skill of hand-drawn camera movement. You can enroll in this individual course or in the entire collection of advanced animation courses called Mastering Motion. The link is in the description. All right, for this first video, you're not going to see the entire uh, keyframing process. You're going to see the first three rudimentary sketches laid out but these first drawings are very important. They kind of define how the rest of the animation is going to look. One of the ideas I had was a SWAT team member rappelling down a skyscraper. This is the drawing that I did as a feeler. And now I'm going into an evolved version of that, which is a little bit more crazy, which is a, a guy jumping out of a high story window and uh, landing in another building. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the first frame. I'm really just figuring out the angle. Now I've imagined it starting in a corridor. I have found a few different references that I like and I just really like this idea of turning in the corridor. I think there's just something nice about someone who turns a corner as they're running through a corridor. There's a lot of nice animation you can make of that. One such example, very different example, but this reference footage here of uh, this uh, unfortunate fellow who uh, is being chased by a jaguar. And uh, I really liked the way he turned that corner though. You'll start to see through this process me pulling from very different sources, video sources that I find and not exactly taking one-to-one -one from any of them, but just you'll hopefully see just a very light inspiration uh, for them because I'm kind of doing uh, level three referencing where I'm not directly pulling frames from anything uh, because I'm quite confident in my own abilities to to draw the human body and the human locomotion. So that was one of the references that inspired me but this is the main reference that I looked at and thought wow here we go watch this. One. Let's get it. Yeah, First of all, before I talk about the technical things about this clip, I want to talk about the experience of this, which is as soon as he jumps off that ledge and you follow him, it dawns on you how far it is to fall. Before you step off that ledge, you can't see how high up they are. I like that little surprise you get, and I wanted to create that surprise. So I would say that I'm doing level three referencing with this. Very little imitation of it pose to pose, but the experience, that's what I'm trying to capture in my animation. Although it was really good information on these steps, seeing his uh, posture, his arms, his legs in preparation for this jump, as well as this critical moment in the few steps before he jumps off, getting that foot placement right so that he can set one foot onto the edge of that cliff Putting his foot on an elevated spot like that gets him a little bit more elevation in his jump. This one that I also used to inform my running poses, really nice poses inside this bit of stock footage. Just have a look at this. This guy, he might not be that fast for all I know, but I know that his poses in his run are just amazing with those fingers splayed. The fabric is looking good. He has quite a muscular physique and quite an aggression to the way he's running. It looks really good to my eyes, so this was ideal. The camera low to the ground, running with him and allowing him to overtake from the side. It's just ideal for what I was looking for. Okay, so where are we at right now? I've just drawn the first environment. I started with the environment. It's just a very rudimentary corridor, but with a low camera angle. I knew the trick to creating that low angle. The trick is to keep these two lines close to being horizontal. 
They don't have to be absolutely horizontal, but close to being horizontal, that's gonna give this perspective the uh, low angle, the low dynamic angle that it needs. Now with the character, I'm working out the defining pose for this section of the movement. And as you can see, that defining pose is him uh, with four points of contact on the ground. So he's just rolled and he's gotten out of that roll and he's stabilizing himself and he's kind of fighting the previous momentum he had from uh, running down that other perpendicular corridor. At this stage, when I'm drawing the first frame, I'm actually kind of improvising a little bit. I didn't have the full story mapped out in my mind. I'm kind of figuring it out as I'm going along. He's not got a sword yet. <laughs> But I did know that he was going to run and jump out of the window and I knew that in order to run and jump out of a window of a high story building, you're going to need some ferocity. There needs to be a degree of madness to this character and a lot of energy. So I want his head to be down and that it's in the performance, it's reflected in the performance. His head is down, he's focused, there's no relaxation in there. Now what you're going to find in this process and this is throughout the keyframe animation processes. I go back and forth between the environment and the character. I nudge forward a little bit with the environment and then I nudge forward a little bit with the character. And I keep them mostly in pace with one another um, throughout this. I'll draw a few frames with one, but then after a little while, I wanna catch up with my drawings of the, of the environment. If, in order for it to feel like the character is in the environment, it's kind of important to me that I draw them more or less uh, simultaneously. However, one difference between them is that they are on two separate layers. I don't always do that in these 3D animation parts. Sometimes I draw everything on one layer, but for this, I decided to have the character on its own layer above the environment. So you see me go back and forth between these two layers on the timeline. You can do this easily by pressing the up and down keys. Now here's a hot tip for that and it's gonna really help you. One thing you'll see is that I've reduced the opacity of the lower environment layer. This is so useful when you do this because you don't have to change the color of your pen as you go back and forth between the environment and the character and you will be able to see instantly when you are drawing on the wrong layer because it will look different. It looks different when you draw the environment. It's more of a washed out look. When you just tweak the, uh, the opacity of the layer, it's basically reduced the number of errors I make of drawing bits on the wrong layer. It's reduced it down to practically zero. I never make that mistake. Okay, anyway, back to the drawing. Check this out. Okay. So we're drawing the doorway again from a different angle. Bang, right there. You see that line on the inside of the corridor remains perfectly horizontal. And every frame after that, that shows that particular line, they will all be horizontal. Now that's a big deal. Let's take a moment to just pay attention across these two frames that I'm flicking between, which lines are changing in angle and which lines are staying the same with the angle. It's only the lines that are moving through depth which are changing angle when we're moving horizontally. The faces that are flat in relation to the camera, that have no zeb depth in relation to the camera viewpoint, they are not gonna change in their angles as we truck to the left. So coming up, I'm gonna draw the second defining pose which is gonna show him leaping out of the corridor and starting that dive roll. Um, have a look at how I start drawing this character. Just a single curved line or a, or a circle for the head. Just really basic shapes and lines to describe the gesture of how this character is moving. Not getting wrapped up in the details at all. It's just a shape to describe it just so that quickly you understand what's going on. This actually retains a lot of the energy when you draw like this in this very rudimentary way. And you can always add to the detail later. If you start off too detailed, then the drawing will take longer and you will actually lose from your short-term memory the, uh, the memory of where the character is going, where the character has gone, because you'll be caught up in the detail and that will lose a lot of the energy that you'll have within the poses and within the animation as a whole. 
I'm also a big fan of using the perspective warp and the free transform tool. So you see, I've drawn it here, but it's not at its optimal state here. And in fact, if I skewed it a little bit and I rotated it a little bit, I could actually move it into position, but without breaking those gestural lines and patterns that I naturally get in my drawings. Later on, you will see me use it very often in my work. Now I'm going back to that doorway, trying to figure out the composition which makes sense, but it also has clarity and looks good. It's kind of balancing those three things, those three elements of drawing, I suppose. Now here's an interesting thing. Right now, I'm not really thinking about how the camera is going to move, but I am creating three different shots of the same environment and Later on, it's going to be my job to link up these three frames. But right now, I'm just trying to get those three frames correct and consistent with one another. I was watching a behind the scenes documentary on the creation of Mad Max Fury Road by George Miller, uh, directed by George Miller. And on the set of the film, he was instructing the camera operator with the most simple and marvelous <laughs> insight into action camera movement. It was so simple and it helps me so much. He just said, keep the action in the middle of the frame. So a lot of what I do with the composition is just making sure that it always comes back to the middle of the frame. We followed him as he dived through and no, he didn't stay fully within the center of the frame, but that was the motivation for moving the camera. The motivation for moving the camera was to try and keep him in the center of the frame. Whenever he gets a bit too far outside the center of the frame and is about to go off screen, just draw the next frame closer to the center. Just keep bringing him back to the center. For this exact part here, I'm actually choosing to keep the window in the center of the frame, more or less. That's the thing he's got his attention focused on and that's where he's aiming for. Anyway, that pose is shaping up nicely, so I'm going to flick back and forth so you can see what I'm looking at there. So my imagination is filling in the gaps of those two frames. Now, I've thought of another way of explaining what's happening with the wall parallax here. So I'm going to just show you a little demonstration of what I'm thinking of when it comes to the vanishing point. That's coming up next. All right, so I hope you got a lot of information out of that sample video. And if you're interested in taking the full course, the link is in the description. So I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.